Good evening. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Titzaveh. And last week during our shear, I asked, I brought up the question that the Mepharshim asked and said that since it, the answer pertains to Titzava, we'll talk about it next week, this week. And that's what I want to open today's Parsha discussion with. The question posed was, why are all of the Kalim of the Mishkan written and de detailed in Parsha's Truma, but the Mizbeach HaKetores, which had three names, Mizbeach HaKetores, Mizbeach HaZohov, and Mizbeach HaPnimi. Those three names describe the Mizbeach HaKetores, and that description and detail is in this week's Parsha at the end. It's separated from all the other Kalim and everything else said in Parsha's Truma. Why was it separated? So the answer the Mephorshim say is that one of the ingredients in the Ketoris was Chelbana. Now Chelbana had a offensive or odor, but it was in the fragrance of the Ketaris, it was magnificent. You didn't know there was any bad odored item that was included. And why was it there? And the Mephorshim say in Chazal bring to show us that Ketaris is a compilation is a combination of all types of yidden. There's one of the items had a tremendous good smell. One had thickness. One had, everyone had, everything had a different component that it was outstanding for, which represented the, comp, the totality of Klal Yisrael that Klal Yisrael never existed of one group. And as I said to you a few weeks ago, that's why the, the, the Kadmonim bring, that there's the minute to put 12 windows in every base of Medrash representing each and every Shevet. And each and every Shevet was different. Yaakov Avinu gave out a bracha to each one, very different from the other, because they were completely steeped in their area of expertise or their DNA of tremendous netia to one area. And that represents really Klal Yisrael because you walk into a shul that they're davening svard. So you see certain minhogim, look at how svardim, the real svardim, have a different Sefer Torah that they hold up as they lay and they don't lay it down on the bima. I mean, there's so many different things to the Menhagim of Klal Yisrael. So that is the message of the Ketoris. That we incorporate and have as a totality the embodiment of Klal Yisrael, which comprises so many different flavors, sizes, tastes, everything. But the question remains, why was it separated from Truma? And the answer is, say the Mephorshim, because the Big Day Kahuna, which is basically the discussion of Titzava, the, the Big Day Kahuna represent Aaron HaKoyen. I mean, he was the Koyen Godel, and under him, and under his umbrella, the, all of the regular Koyanim functioned. Aaron HaKoyen accentuated and underscored the love for each and every Jew, and that's why it says, by Yivku Kol Beis Yisrael when he was Nifter. By Moshe Rabbeinu, it doesn't say Kol Yisrael, it says B'nai Yisrael because he excelled, Aaron HaKoyen, in promoting Shalom Bayez, Shalom Ben Odom Lachavero, 
and Sholem in the totality of Klal Yisrael because of his love, his limitless love for each and every Yid. Now, when we get done learning about the Begodim and the Hanhoga of Aaron HaKoyen, then we can come to talk about the Chelbana in the Ketoris. Because after you appreciate each and every Yid, which Aaron HaKoyen stands for, and each and every Indian of Kahuna, which brings out the love for each and every Yid, Kosovarcha has been Israel Amor Lohem, that it had a Tanai of Bi'ahava, that they had to make sure that they were making the Brocha B'Shem Malchus and then giving the Yivarechacha and Yo'er and Yisa, all the three Psukim of Birchas Koyanim, but it had to be Bi'ahava. And that could come out only when you're immersed in the Indian with the backbone of Aaron HaKoyen. And after you are drenched with Avas Yisrael, you can then go into a Parsha of even a Yid who is not from and doesn't wear the same hat that you wear or yarmulke that you wear and still have strong love. And that's what we combined in the, tor- in the Ketores. And that's why it's listed after the Parsha of Aaron Hakoye. Now, we know that one of the things that Aaron Hakoye wore as Koye Gordel was at the bottom. He had bells. At the bottom of his main beged, he had bells, pamoinim. And it served to warn the koyanim, to alert. That's not the, the word warn makes it sound like they were afraid of him or something. But alert the koyanim that Aaron HaKoyen was on his way in. And if you heard, let's say if a principal of a school would wear bells at the bottom of it, and he comes onto the floor, he's not sitting in his office, it's a notice to the classrooms or to anyone in the hallway that the, that the principal's on his way. That's what happened with Aaron HaKoyen as the Koyen Godel. Now, what Mefarshim basically underscore on that Indian is that every step makes a difference. Because a person was woken up. He was awakened when he got the message that the coin girdle was, was down, the, down the corridor. And that each step makes a difference in how you look, how you think, how you act. But the Gemara says that Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Yoshua, the famous Tan of the Harav, uh, Rav Yoshua ben Hanania, before he used to walk into his house, he used to tap on the door. That means he didn't wait for someone to give him permission to come into his own house. But he wanted to show an example and live the example of what it means to have derech eretz for people, to have a sensitivity for people. And that sensitivity was brought out by the fact that he didn't just walk in on his family, and this was his own family, not strangers. But by tapping on the door, it showed a sign of a a very silent respect that exuded for him for the people in the house, that each and every, the young and the old, should know that he's coming in. Just out of an acknowledgement, 
it raised the respect level of people, which brought out in the people so much good and so much flavor for them to be able to carry out in their lives attitude. Now, it says, V'nishma kolo bevo'o el hakodesh. That means that when these bells rang, you could hear him coming into the Kodesh. Now, the Yerushalmi says, on that Pasuk, it says, Yavo kol v'yechaper al kol. There were two words called in our parsha, v'nishma kolo bevo'o el ha-kodesh, because of these bells that they were able to hear throughout the base of Megdash, where he was, at what place and in what spot in the base of Megdash. And there was a kol demei achicha, the second kol, by Odom Arishon, by Hevel and Kayan, that when Kayan went and killed Hevel, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Kol Demeyachicha, the voice of the blood of your brother that you just killed is calling out, is crying out to me from the earth. So the Yerushalmi says that that kol demeyachicha needs a kapara. He went and killed his brother. So that kol should come, the kol of the nishma kol of bevo el ha should be mechaper for the kol of kol demeyachicha. Now the obvious question shouts out, what does one have to, one was cold-blooded murder, and the other was functioning in the Beis HaMikdash. So, Kadmoinim say an eye-opener. How is it that somebody could go and kill someone else? After all, besides all the halachas of killing someone, and you have to come back as a Gilgal, and you're punished with misa bidei adam. I mean, there's so much severity in killing someone, and you're going over to a yid with, with tselem elokim, and you're taking him away after he was placed here on earth, and with a tafkin and with a tachlis, coming over and killing someone, how does it happen? Because children are brought up in every Jewish home with such severity attached to the life of another person. The Yushami says that if a raw that if somebody sees somebody dying and he could run to get a doctor, but he runs to the Rav first to ask him, Ashayla, am I allowed to do this and this and call Hatzola, am I allowed to do So it calls the person who asked the Shaila a murderer. Because if that person died because of his silliness, he was running around asking Shailas while someone's dying. And the Yerushalmi calls the Rav also a Rutzeyach because he never taught his tzibur the halachas in regard to saving a life on Shabbos. And someone sees that someone's choking. You do what you have to do to save the person. You don't go run and ask a shayla. And you see how severe the Yerushalmi treats someone who takes the two minutes that could be the difference of life and death Someone's having a stroke, lo aleinu, lo aleichem, a thousand times. A stroke, the difference in two minutes 
every hot solo member will tell you if sometimes whether the guy's going to be paralyzed the rest of his life or he's going to be able in the first minute if they can put certain medicine into him then it clears the path a little bit for saving him so how could somebody take the achrayas and start asking shilas there's a time and there's a place to ask a shaila. And sometimes you have to ask that, but not by pikuach nefesh. So, the answer basically that the Kadmoinim say, it doesn't start with a person being able to murder someone. It starts with the beginning of zero respect for another person. And then it builds itself up. It leads to the terrible act of murder because at the end of the ladder, the person who commits the murder had zero chashivas in the life of another person. But it didn't start like that. It started with slamming a door in someone's face, not waiting the two minutes to... Let somebody come through the door that has five packages, appreciating the person's chashivas and their worthiness as a human being to be extended the dignity of a human being. But if a person grow, grows up, like I saw once somebody in a line at a car wash, there were 20 cars lined up waiting for their turn to come and somebody drove up right to the head of the line and forced himself in. So there were some people that got out of their cars and they were yelling at him. It was almost a fist fight. How did that man disregard the 20 cars? Because he had no respect for any person that was sitting in his car. It meant nothing to him. His saving five minutes or ten minutes was all that mattered to him. Or the guy who goes out and double parks and says, oh, it's just for a minute, a minute or two, give me the minute. But meantime, he blocked three cars from pulling out because he was double parked. So his three minutes, or which usually turns into ten minutes, uh, was because of the disregard for a person's time. His time or his convenience was all that mattered to him, but not somebody else. If they were just getting in their car and had to pull up, meant nothing. So that, say the Kadmoinim, is why we have to, in teaching our children and our students, enhance dignity of people, to give examples of what it means to stand aside when somebody older is coming in. Or like the old woman who was maybe 85, and this is a true story, somebody was overwhelmed. They were standing on the bus, and a, a very old lady got on the bus, and no one stood up. There were youngsters, teenagers, all was see. No, they let the elderly lady stand there. And she was obviously on the bus for a while because she wasn't getting off. But they didn't care that she was standing because they never were taught appreciation for another human being. And that says the Medrash, the Yerushalmi, that Yavo Kol, that the kol of inishma kolo bevo el hakodesh, which showed a sensitivity to people in warning them that the kohen gadol was coming, it can go with that kol and be machapra on the kol of kol de me because one begins with simple, simple action, and it leads at the end of one's life to murder. Now. We know that in this parsha, there it states because it was the Mishkan and they had to be told what type of karbonos. So there's a parsha talking about the Tomit shel Shachar and the Tomit shel Ben Hoar Bayim. The Tomit shel Shachar was something which was brought every day 
every week, whether it was Yom Tif or Shabbos, there was a Korban Tomit Shel Shachar, and then it had its pair the afternoon, the Tomit Shel Bain Hoar Bayim. And the Parsha that we have in Tetzava about it is the exact same Parsha that is in Parsha's Pinchas. And we lay in every Rosh Chodesh. That Parsha, Tzavas Bnei Yisrael, Via Marta Aleyem, Es Korbani Lachmi Leishai, Reach Nichochi Tishmeru Lahakrav Li Bemoado. And when it says, though, in, in our parsha, it says, Es HaKeves Ho Echad. And over there it says, Es HaKeves Echad. The whole difference between that parsha and this parsha is one hay. The hay of the word Ho Echad that we have here. And in that parsha, it just says, Es HaKeves Echad. Tasev HaBoker. Echad without a hay. And here it's with the hay. So Rav Chaim Briska said that the reason that there is this hay here is because of the fact that a person has to know that the halacha is if one of the pears was missing, they couldn't get the lamb for the morning, you could still in the afternoon bring the Tomit Shel Bein Bayim. But if on the very first day of the Mishkan they didn't have it, you couldn't bring the afternoon. That was the only time in the 1100 years that there were being Makriv, the Tomit Shel Shachar and Tomit Shel Bein Bayim, if the Shachar was missing, they could still do the, the Mincha, but not the first day, because beginnings have to be pure and have to be perfect. So the first day of the Mishkan, when they brought the Tomet Shel Shachar and Tomet Shel Beno Abayim, which they did have, Baruch Hashem, both, but if it would have been a case, the Halacha says Reb Chaim uh, is, is the first day, if they didn't have, you can't bring the afternoon, because the pair the first day must be perfect. To teach us that beginnings must be perfect. And I want to cite to you the case the case when Klal Yisrael came in to Eretz Yisrael, the first place they went was to Yericho. Now HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, no one is to take from the booty, from you're going to conquer the city. Yoshua went around with everyone and the walls, it was a walled city, the walls came down. And they were told, you'll conquer the city, but no one take any booty. Now, there was one man whose name was Ochon. Ayin Chof Nun. Who stuffed his pockets with booty. And it says that Hashem was so angry at what he did that the next city they went to, and Chazal say this, was I. And they were, Klal Yisrael was going to be completely destroyed because of what Ochan did. But Avram Avinu, 600 years before that, saw what was going to happen, that this Ochan was going to do it and make Hashem very angry at Klal Yisrael. So he went to Ai by Beiskel and he davened then that the Yidden should not be destroyed. So at the end, say Chazal, that there was a, many, many were killed 
They almost lost the war. But because Avram Avinu had Davin 600 years before, they were not decimated, they were not destroyed completely. Now, I submit to you the obvious question. I mean, what Achan did was bad. And we, says the Arizal, say Aleinu al Kain nekave the second paragraph of Aleinu, which are the first letters, Ayin Chof Nun, as a ticken to the Avera of what Ochan did. That means every Aleinu that we say at the end of Shachris, the end of Minchadia, we're supposed to be Mechavan a Kapora for Ochan, for what he did when he stuffed his pockets with the booty. So I ask you, I mean, what he did was a terrible thing. HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him not to, and he flagrantly did what he wanted. But I can name you 20 Averis that are much worse than that. Go destroy a whole Klal Yisrael because he took the booty, and they would have been destroyed completely to the last Jew in I? And because Avram Avinu saw the 600, he saved them, and only a, a chunk of them were killed, but not everyone. So they were not fully destroyed. Is it such a terrible thing to destroy a Klal Yisrael? So the Mephorshim say yes, because the first place that they conquered when they came into Israel was Yericho. And beginnings have to be perfect. When a Yid gets married and he starts the first day in his household, if he's not busy with the Yitzhahara, that he's so tired from the Chasna and he's not this, he'll learn the next day or two days later, or someone knocked at the door for Tzedakah, who has the Koyach to open the door. Never in one's life should they let, I mean, if they're not home or they don't hear it, but under normal circumstances, someone's knocking at the door, you go to the door, and as long as it's safe, you ask who it is, or you open it up for the, and give the man Sadako with a smile. And if you do that the first day you move into the house, you'll be doing it for the next hundred years in the house. So that is the limud that we understand from the story of Achon, how far-reaching and how much the roots of our actions and our attitude, how they flourish, to what extent they flourish. Because no one would say, go destroy a whole cloud yourself because of what one guy did. And that the Arizal says we're still 3,300 years later saying Aleinu, and the, the, those three words, Achan al Kain Nekava, is a kapora for what he did. But because it was a beginning, it was a magnifying glass on every machshava, deeper and maisa to make sure there was perfection. Now, Now, we know that Moshe Rabbeinu, his name is not mentioned in this Parsha. Why not? So the answer is because when Moshe Rabbeinu was pleading for Klal Yisrael, he said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu something that there was a point zero zero one criticism for how he spoke to Hashem. He said, listen, they did the Misa Egel, and we're going to be in Golas. Had, had they not done the Misa Egel, the Gula Shlema would have happened. Right by Har Sinai, this would have been Gula Shlema, Mashiach, Tchias Amesim, everything would have happened. But because they didn't, and they did the eagle. 
So we're still in Golas to this day, 3,300 years later. So he said to Hashem, If you're not going to forgive them, erase my name, take my name out. And that was criticized because you don't speak to HaKadosh Baruch Hu like that. And because he said such a thing, his name was taken out from Parshas Tetzaveh. Now, the, the question is, why was it specifically Parshas Tetzaveh? In other words, he said, take my name out of your book, meaning from the whole Torah. So he was punished at one Parsha. Why was Tetzaveh chosen as the Parsha that his name does not appear? So Harav Ovadu Yosef, Zichron Levrocha, says in his Sefer that the reason it was Parsha's Tetzave, because if you start from Bereshis and you go Sedra by Sedra and you count how many Sedras, Bereshis, Noyach, Lech, Lecha, Vayera, Chayasora, Toldos, Vayetze, it's the 20th Parsha. And because Moshe Rabbeinu said, Misifracha, from your book, take my name out, Sefer Chof. From the Sefer, which is the 20th Parsha, Chof is 20. That's what he says. And that's why it was specifically Parsha's Tetzava, because that is the 20th Parsha in the Torah. But the Kadmonim say a different Teretz. Moshe Rabbeinu originally was destined to be the Kohen Gadol. And because he debated and gave a hard time to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him in the beginning, you're going to go take out the Yidden from Mitzrayim. And he answered and said, no, I'm a, a, a tongue tight and uh, I'm not the person for it. It should be Aaron. He's my older brother. I don't want him to be sad. The Kodesh Baruch Hu said he won't be sad and he will absolutely be happy in his heart. And by the way, Chazal say, the Gemara brings, that he was zoicha to have the breastplate on his chest, the Urim Vetumim, the Choshen, on his chest because of those words, Verach of his Samach Belibo, that he'll be happy in his heart. And he was happy. And because he was happy, he was Zoycha to have the Urim Vetumim on his heart, on his chest. But Moshe Rabbeinu, and after he debated Hashem for seven days, Hashem took away the gift of Kahuna Gedoyla, and he said to him that you will be the Levi. You're going to be like the head, the manig of Klai Yisrael, but you're not going to be the Koyen Godel. Now, when Aaron participated in the eagle, which he was only stalling for time, he wasn't doing anything which was wrong, but, he was st- but still, the Pusik even says, he was stalling for time. He was trying to get the women to go get their jewelry and the men to bring what they, what they needed to make an eagle and everything. He was stalling for time. His kavana was a thousand percent good. But the fact is that if somebody was observing what's going on, it looked like he was participating. So because of that, the kahuna gedolah was going to be taken away from him and given back to Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu begged HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please do not take away the kahuna gedolah from Aaron HaKoyen.
And he won the day. And now the Dakota said, okay, we'll let him still be the Kohen Godel. But Moshe Rabbeinu, because there was a Hava Mina, because Hashem said, in the beginning, we're going to take it after the eagle and give it back to you. Everyone knew about this. And he didn't want in the parsha that deals with Kohanim and the Begodim to be even lurking in the corner as if like somebody who could have been something and they're standing there shaking their head, well, I didn't do it or I didn't get it, but I had my opportunity, I could have been. So he didn't even want his name in the parsha with Kahuna and with Big Day Kahuna. And that's why his name is not mentioned in this Parsha. Now, I had once told you that Noyach was a Gilgal into Moshe Rabbeinu because he didn't daven for the generation. And he didn't daven for the generation because he was Like a tzaddik b'fneatza, the Torah says he was a tzaddik, but he didn't daven, he had to come back from Moshe Rabbeinu, and that's why Moshe Rabbeinu's life began in the Teva, and that's the reason that it rained for 40 days, because it was supposed to be Matan Torah by Noyach, but he wasn't Zoicha because it was a door of Rishoyim, and he never davened for them. So by the Mecheni, no, Moshe Rabbeinu came full force to daven, for Klal Yisrael, and the words Mecheni are the letters Me Noyach, meaning the Mabel, a remez, that at this point he was Mesakin for Noyach, the Pagam that he didn't daven, and he came out and forcefully davened to the point that he was ready to have his name taken out of the Torah if HaKadosh Baruch Hu wasn't Moichel then. Now, the Pusik in the beginning of the Sedra, it says that he that we also as big day Aaron Hakoyen Lakadesho Ulakahano Li, which means Lakadesho to sanctify, to make a kiddush Hashem. Ulacha no li, and it has to be for him. The Gemara learns up that the begodim have to be clean, and that al koyen who walks out in dirty clothes is chay of misa. It doesn't mean misa bidei adam that he's killed here in this world, but it's called misa bidei shemayim in heaven. Because he has to be a shining example of how you walk before our Kodesh Baruch Hu. And if you have dirty clothes, you're not making that shining example in any form or in any which way. But in one Pasuk it says, L'chavod ulusiforis which makes it sound like the trappings, like it has to be beautiful. Eh? And then the next Pasuk says, L'Kadosh L'Chan Oli, which looks like the actual Begodim, the bottom line. And this, the Arizal says, is because it seems like a contradiction. Because Lechavod ulusiforis is like the form. When you take a package, you put a diamond necklace into a velvet box, and then you put beautiful wrapping and you put ribbons on it. You're enhancing, you're not making it, the, the diamond necklace worth more money, but you're enhancing the beauty and you're making it more appetizing. And that, says the Arizal, was the difference of opinion, the Zoyar Kodr says it, was the difference of opinion of Cain and Hevel. Hevel held 
that it's you must enhance the beauty, not just the actual thing. The carbon had to have all the wool on top. It had to be fat animal. It had to be something that a Kurdish Baruch Not just the fact that you're taking a knife and shechting an animal and putting it on the Mizbeach for Hashem. But there has to be the trappings and the trimmings. And, the, and that represents the kavod ula sephoris. That is called the form. And the... And says the Arizal, that was why we do not allow anyone to wear shatnas. That's why the Torah says no shat. Why? Because what Cain brought was basically the pishton. It was some flax from the ground. And it was garbage. Because he held that the form is not important. It's the bottom line. I have to give a korban with goodwill. And that's it. But trimmings don't have to be there. No, only the substance has to be, but not the form and not the beauty and not the packaging. Hevel held the opposite, that you need the substance, but you must also have the form. And that, says the Arizal, is the reason that it's so severe wearing shot. This is not just the love in the Torah. The Arizal says that if someone puts on something that is shotness, even if they didn't know, they're supposed to check and know before they put it on. Because if you wear shotness, your tefillahs are not listened to for 40 days, says the Arizal. For 40 days, there is no listening to the tefillah of someone who puts on shotness. So says the Arizal. And that Hevel understood that the, because Tzemer is wool, that was his carbon, and the Shatnas was the Pishtun, was the linen. That's what we're not allowed to wear together. That's called Shatnas, linen and wool. And since that was the Machloikas that brought about the murder, we are not allowed over Shatnas, meaning form and substance, wool and flax, that we are not allowed to wear it and why it's so severe because it doesn't say by any other Avera that if the person does the Avera that his tefillahs do not go into Shemayim for 40 days. Now I want to say to you that this upcoming week is Purim Cotton. We have in this week, this week. In Purim Cotton in Shulchan Aruch, there's only one simon with one sif at the end of the whole Orachayim. The whole Orachayim ends up with Purim Cotton, and the Ramah says that we don't say Tachnun and we don't say Hespedim. And it's only one simon, one seif. And he ends off with four words. Mishte Tomid. The. If you look in Orachayim, you'll see the last four words is. I as Hashem will think of it, but the last two words are Mishta Tamid, that a person should have a constant simcha mishta with 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 a a favorable, happy type of eating. Um, hopefully, Oriel, just take a look, please, and forgive me. Um, uh, what he says, but the peop- but everyone, all the Mephorshim are curious, why would he end up with these last four words about uh, having a, a constant su'uda? So in the Gemara, in Baba Basra, at the end, it says what it's referring to, and this Pusik, 
is um, is referring to clarification because a person who doesn't learn Mishnah and then Gemara and doesn't have a conclusion of how to paskin, he's like in the middle of the water. He learned to this and someone asks him a question with that. Well, there's four opinions, this, that, but the bottom line of what the halach is, he can't answer. So the Mephorshim say that this Pusik is referring on Purim specifically to the fact that a, pers a person he was encouraging after learning the whole Orachayim, the Orachayim, the Shulchan Aruch, so that Orachayim is concludes with a bracha that you should be able to mishta tamid have the simcha of being able to paskin the halacha correctly. Is it leiv simcha mishta tamid? Some something like that. And I want to conclude this year today with a Shalom HaKadosh that says that from the time of Matan Torah until Purim, which was 900 years later, we're going to talk a lot about Purim Be'ezus Hashem in the second month of Odor, right before Purim, that Nobody ever made, and the Shlach Kodesh says it, no one ever made a Sudas Purim. That means they made a Brit, not a Sudas Purim, a Suda for a Bris. Because it says, La Yehudim Hoyasa Ora Vesimcha Vesason, and Sason means Mila. And happiness at a Suda is that you have a Suda and that you sing and you say Divrei Torah. So it says that La Yehudim Hoyasa by Purim had Sason Vikor. Says the Shlach Kodesh because they did a bris for 900 years, but they never ever had a Suda for that bris. Um, never had a, and we know that the 39 years in the, in the Midbar, that there was never a Korban Pesach because the Yidden were afraid to be mala anyone because of the tremendous winds in the Midbar, and they thought that someone would put himself into Sakona, into danger in terms of his life if he had bris milah. So for 39 years, they didn't do any bris milah, and, that, and therefore they couldn't do a korban Pesach, because orel lo yochal bo, that if someone didn't have a bris milah, you weren't allowed to participate or eat in the, in the, uh, the meat of the korban pe, uh, pe, Pesach. So we see the power of Chodesh Adar, and the Arizal says that we don't even have a mazel for Adar Sheni, because you don't need a mazel, according to many, because the mazel of Adar Rishon is so high that we come into the realm of Adar Sheni at a high that you don't need any help. You don't need any, that that's how high the second month is, but we're not there yet, and we will get there, Be'ezus Hashem, soon, and that's why the Arizal says that even though every one of the Chushim were Nifgam, that when the woman, when Ochava went, and she touched, and she ate, and she tasted Vatiga, vat, Vatochal, vat, va, Vatiga, um, all of the senses that a person has, the senses, the tasting, the touching, the, uh, were nifkam, were spoiled, except for one. And that was the chush harayach. And that, he says, is for the month of Odor. 
And Ugar carries the day, and that's the reason he says that we smell besamim, because since besamim is the chush reach and it was not nifgam by the chet of Adam Arishon, therefore Motsoi Shabbos, we smell besamim because it's the zman of David Malka Meshicha, as we have a Malava Malka, and we know that. So since it's David Malka Mashiach, it's like after Mashiach will come, because before and after the Chush HaReich are, are all the same. It was never Nifkam, it was never spoiled. And says the Arizal, that's the reason that we have the names that the Gemara is curious. Her name wasn't Esther, her name was Hadassah. Hadassah, says the Arizal, is something you smell. And the Gemara asks, how do you know Mordechai is min Torah? And the Gemara answers and says, Mora Dachya, which is a besamim, which you smell. It's because the whole umbrella of Chodesh Adar is under that effect of Chush HaReyach. And that is how, because it was so high in its source, that Purim will never be bottled. Because when it says that the, every Yom Tev will be bottle, it can't mean like Yom Kippur or Pesach, because the Torah is Nitzchiyas, Torah is forever. So if the Torah says, Shivas Yom Tochal Matzos, then you have to eat Matzah, and it'll be after Mashiach also. But the Meforshim explain that it won't be the same format, that when Yom Kippur we have to fast, it may, the format of fasting may be different. And that's what it means, that all the Yom Toivim will be bottle in their format of today. But the format of tomorrow, except Purim, that Purim is so high it's untouchable before and after, and it will remain just as it was all of the years since Mordechai and Esther lived, which was the last three years of Golis Bovel. Golis Bovel was 70 years, and in the 67th year is when the story, the miracle of Purim took place. And it is the schus of Chush HaReach, says the Arizal, that Yidin were zoichet to so much good in the month of Odor. Uh, have a freilich week. You know, somebody said, what's the pshat? Mishanichnes odor mar bim besimcha. What do you mean mar bim besimcha? How do any of you, how are you mar besimcha? Does it mean you eat an extra steak? Does it mean you take a cup of wine and you have simcha? In simcha el babasar v'yayin? What does mar bim besimcha? So, some meforshim say, Mar bim besimcha, that when you do something for another yid, that means you're supposed to be besimcha. But it doesn't mean bang your head on the wall or jump through the window. It means be besimcha, and that when you daven, try to set your compass uh, in the direction of simcha. If something's bothering you, get it out of your system. But be besimcha while you daven. Be besimcha while you're learning that every word of Torah is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and be besimcha. But when you extend it to another Yid, your mar besimcha, that another Yid should raise his level of simcha and be able to be encompassed within the realm of simcha, that that is something that makes HaKadosh Baruch Hu especially happy because you're lifting the spirits of another Yid. Have a wonderful week, and next week, Be'ezus Hashem, will be speaking on Parshas Kisisa.